Welcome to another episode of the NeverEndingPanel.com. We are here in downtown North Hollywood on Burbank Boulevard at the Los Angeles Science and Fantasy Society, the longest running club in the United States, established in 1934, and I believe just celebrated its 75th anniversary. Uh, tonight's topic will be, among others, let's see, we've got, am I a toaster? Will the advances in robotics and AI, um, with the with the with the advances in robotics and AI, will we recognize when our machines become sentient? That will be our main topic. We also have white hats and black hats. Is science fiction a western in space? Uh, as one of our side topics, what were the other eight plans from outer space? And uh, Aton had a plan that he thought was so good that I thought wasn't good that I've actually forgotten what he thought that topic should be. Aton, what was it again? Well, thank you for that brilliant, <laughs> sterling introduction. The recommendation you give just fills me with warmth and happiness that you think so kindly about it. What it was was immortality, we're going to get it, who's going to get it first? Ah, so you think, okay, so we'll, we'll get to that. That's why I, I okay. Anyway, so let's start uh, by introducing so ourselves. Um, I am Donnie Collin, the co-author of The Unincorporated Man by Tor. Um, to the left of me is Christopher Hardwin, who is an expert in robotics and electronics and technology. To the left of him is Carl Lemke, who is the chairman of the Los Angeles, I'm just going to say Las Fest, it's a lot easier. And then, of course, we've got Arlene Satin, who is the marketing director of Las Fest. And then there is that guy over there who I have to share a title with and um, bad jokes with, otherwise known as Aton Collin, co-author of The Unincorporated Man. So why don't we uh, kick this off with our first question. If a computer can think like a human, the obvious implication is that human thinking is not itself evidence for a soul. If a machine can think as well as a human, then why should we expect humans to have souls? And this person says, I'm not saying there isn't an answer to that question. My point is that the question will become important once we achieve AI. Anybody want to take a crack at that one? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> the microphones want to talk. You stay out. <laughs> All right, I'll start out. That's fine. Yeah. Um, there, uh, there are so many uh, applications for artificial intelligence. There's the, uh, the new uh, systems of uh, surgery, which they use uh, a hand, uh, the, the surgeon can step away from the body and use a machine and cut more preci pre precisely, and, and they can use uh, laparoscopy, la laparoscopic uh, procedures instead of uh, cutting you open and pulling you apart. You know, there are so many applications with that, to the point of also uh, robots are uh, even androids being created right now um, to do space travel, things that. Right, but, but these are these are systems. None these of are this, systems. I, I, I'm going right for the meat because my dad's a rabbi. Ah. Um, so in other words, <laughs> the okay. notion of, of uh, AI talks to the notion of sentience, talks to the notion of soul, a soul. And I'm just wondering well, where I we. Well, I bring can, up yeah. I bring up the the uh, one about space travel is because if you are a programmed, mathematically programmed robot that uh, responds strictly to commands that are typed into your system by a human, then if you're in space and there's an, uh, an asteroid heading towards you, you can't react and you're going to get crushed. However, so the um, creation of artificial intelligence in itself, uh, making a robot or an android to be um, able to respond by using something like fuzzy logic. Uh, and fuzzy logic is, uh, is, uh, is uh, linguistics uh, instead of mathematics, what, mathematical. You are already building, starting building blocks to creating we're, a thinking mechanical person. But we're not going to be worried about that. We're not going to be theologically challenged by that. You're describing essentially something like the intellectual ability of a fly, which as you know, when you try to swat, it gets the hell out of the way. Um, what we're talking about is something far more fundamental, I think. When we create something that doesn't say no, but far more dangerously says why, and means it, and won't do it until it actually we give it a good answer, that's when we have a real question, that's when we have a real problem on our hands. Well, Especially if this thing controls our electricity, our air, our nuclear I'm weapons. I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which brings us to a different uh, type of network for uh, the development of uh, artificial intelligence, which is, which is a neural network. Um, now that is... Skynet is your friend. Yes, exactly. It <laughs> learns by experiences. It's not something that's programmed into them and then they go, 
okay, I do this, and then I learn on top of this. These are, are uh, robots that are being taught like a child, and they, they are taught not just responses, but emotions. They have facial expression. Um, they they uh, become toddlers until eventually they become adults. They're thinking, they're learning, just like a human baby would learn. So now we have to stop and think. If that's what already st exists today, then... Well, that, that's what exists today because that's what worked for Homo sapiens. In other words, dinosaurs were around for a while without not... They didn't have a lot of intelligence. In other words, human beings are built to survive, and intelligence is one of the things that they use in their bag of tricks to survive. Right. Dinosaurs, you know, for a while had lots of meat and claws and, and gnarly teeth, and that worked for a long time. So it almost begs the question, this has worked for us in terms of our survival. If you develop some sort of, sort of sentient um, computational system, intelligence might be part of that bag of tricks. I, I'm just curious as to what it's, uh, well, you know, yeah. as all the science fiction talks about, to survive it would probably get rid of us. You know? well, one, of the, uh, one of the books that's being marketed rather heavily right now, just recently published, is uh, Dinesh D'Souza's book, uh, Life After Death, The Evidence. And he goes, through, he goes through a whole bunch of what he considers fairly convincing evidence that there is something in us that survives dying, something that will linger on after our bodies and our electrical impulses have quit, quit working. Um, and and I've been following the evolution debate for a while, and I think a lot of the a lot of the trouble that people have with evolution is that we get reduced to mechanistic uh, processes. Our bodies, our muscles, are proteins that sort of ratchet past each other in response to ATP turning to ADP and releasing energy. Our brains are electrical impulses that go from neuron to neuron. And in theory, eventually you could map our brains onto a computer network and produce an exact duplicate of your brain, my brain, someone else's brain. You, you could produce a duplicate. You couldn't produce the processes. Because in other words, even the, um, from my understanding, the dendrites, the amount of concentration a person looks well, at an object and doesn't look at an object is, a, is the amount of, of electrical impulse shooting through that at that moment. Well, so in, in theory, how are you going to, you know, yeah, in that's theory, what Eitan's saying, the, the why part. In theory, that, you could, you know. in theory, you could model an individual nerve cell, axons, dendrites, and everything. Uh, it, it'll be fiendishly difficult because it's not a binary system. But in principle, you could model it, and then you could model the one next to it and the one next to that, and on for the other hundred billion or so neurons that are in a brain. Uh, if you do that faithfully enough, you either will or you will not generate a system capable of asking why. And that's going to be really interesting. And in either the day case, you can create that system and it doesn't ask why, it's yeah, almost evidence of the Basically, in either case, it's going to be an astonishing result. Correct. Correct. That's the main thing. In either thing. case, it becomes an astonishing result. Because if you do that and it doesn't ask why, you've essentially proven what this book is sort of talking about, yeah. which is that there that is you, something out there. And by the way, the implication of that book, or what you're saying, is not just after you die. The implication is while you're alive, it's also there. It, exactly. Which yes. brings us sort of, you know, rounds up into that first. Exactly. Question. You want to keep it down, Chris, because I'm really having. A <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was a professional <laughs> mime before I was a roboticist. Um, I actually, you know, it's a, it's a, this whole discussion is rather, rather funny for me. It's been a long discussion. Every, whenever anyone hears I'm in, into robotics and, and I have a robotics background, the first, this is the first conversation that comes up. Um, Anyways, our next conversation. Security. One of the, you know, I actually, as fortune would have it, I had the luxury of uh, meeting and having dinner with Steve.